Okay, so I'm going to give a little tutorial on how to plot focal mechanisms for fault planes with an equal area stereo net. Uh, so if you look at a stereo net, um, you'll notice that there are uh, two prominent line or grid patterns on here. Uh, the first are these, you can use the outside circle and then these other circles that kind of follow that same pattern. Those are referred to as the great circles. And then you have uh, this other curved pattern, uh, which are referred to as the small circles. So these great circles are there to show the, the dip of the plane to help you draw the dip. And then the small circles are there to help you plot the azimuth or compass directions of whatever you're plotting. So if you remember, we likened the stereo net to looking down into some sort of bowl, okay? And picture a plane coming through and intersecting this bottom of the bowl. That's what we plot when we're plotting planes on stereo nets. So here I have a plane. Notice how it's dipping and notice how it intersects the bottom of the bowl along that line, okay? Um, the steeper that my plane is dipping, the more towards the middle of the stereo net it will be, and the more shallow it's dipping, the closer to the edge of that stereo net circle it will be. Okay? So now let's show you how to plot this. All right, so first thing, I have a thumbtack there in the middle, and the reason I have that is so I can place the tracing paper. Where is that thumbtack? On that. And if you look up at the top, first thing I do is I write down my measurement. Okay, which this is taken from Badger Creek, so this is the measurement of one of those faults. And I don't have it written down here. Uh, you can write this down if you want, but that first number is the strike, the second number is the dip, third number is the rake, and then that letter, that's the fault motion. Okay. So the first thing I need to do is I need to plot um, the actual fault plane. So I'm going to use the strike and dip to plot that line, that fault plane. Okay. Before I do that, I'm going to mark down where north is. And then the azimuth directions. Whoops. And then you can also trace the outline of the circle as well. All right, so my strike is 110. All right, so to plot that, I use the small circles, and there is a bold line every 10 degrees. Okay. Since I have 90 here, 180 there, 90, that's going to be 100. This is going to be 110. So that is the strike of this fault plane. Okay. So now I need to plot the dip. To do this, I rotate, I'll write down that's 110. I'll rotate that strike back to the top. And now I can trace one of these great circles to show the dip of the plane. Okay, so my, my dip is 64. So remember the outside circle, that's horizontal or zero degrees. And this line in the middle, that is vertical or a 90 degree dip. Okay, so I can either count from zero or count back from 90. And you can see that there are bold lines every 10 degrees. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 
50, 60, and then there are two degree intervals after that, 62, 64. So that is 64. So then what I do is I trace from the top along this great circle. All right, and then if I rotate N back to the top, that shows me what my fault plane looks like. Okay, so now let's compare that to this bowl demonstration. So it's oriented more or less like this. All right, but we aren't done yet. Okay, this shows the plane. We need to show what the motion is along that plane. And to do that, we're gonna rotate this back to the top. And our next step is we take the entire stereo net. Okay, we aren't hinging it along that thumbtack. We're taking the entire thing and we are rotating that entire thing to create a smiley face or to make that plane dip towards us. Okay. All right, so the next step is to plot the pull to the plane. And to do that, we uh, go from, from this point right here. So this middle line, we're using this middle line um, along the small circles. And we are going to then use the great circles and plot 90 degrees from that. We can go either 90 degrees up or 90 degrees down. Okay. Um, so once again, using the great circles, we've got 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and we end up there. Okay. Notice how we can also go the other direction, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. It takes us to the same place. All right, so that's just a point that represents uh, basically a perpendicular line coming off of that plane, like my hand is the plane and the pencil is the pole. Okay, since it's uh, dipping like that, this is going to intersect at that point. I guess I could show you with this bowl. So that's the plane we have. So the pole is going to intersect, that line is going to intersect the bowl right there, which is what we're drawing. Okay. All right, so now the next step is to plot the rake, which is 75. And for that, we are going to use the small circles. And we are going to count from the right along these small circles, 75 degrees. So we have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 75. I'll put a point there. And then to show the fault motion, it's normal. Uh, for normal faults, you draw an arrow pointing down off of that rake. Uh, so this is basically showing the direction of motion along that uh, slicken line on the fault plane. Okay, if it's a reverse fault, you would draw that going up. All right. All right, now here's the step that gets left out. Uh, we need an additional point to help us draw the focal mechanism. And that additional point needs to be on the fault plane, and it needs to be 90 degrees on this fault plane from the rake. So once again, you can go either direction, to the right or to the left, uh, but go 90 degrees. So 10, 20, 30. 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. And I would get to that same spot going the other direction. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. Okay. All right, so now the fun part. Now what you do is you need to match up this 90 degree from rake and the pull along the same great circle. You want them to get on the same line. Right now, 
this is on that great circle and this is on this great circle, they aren't matching up. So to do that, we can rotate the stereo net. All right, so now notice how you have this bold line and this is about 40, four degrees away from that bold line and this is about four degrees from that bold line. They're now on the same great circle and what I do is I trace that great circle. Oh, I messed up. You see how it's not matching up? That is because they are not on the same great circle. I should have been looking at the stereo net and not through the camera lens. <laughs> Alright, so that means that... Okay, that actually works out better. So now they're on the same bold line. Okay. Okay, and before you sketch, this is the mistake I made, it'd be good to just follow that and make sure that they actually are on the same line. Okay. Alright, so they are. All right, so now we are at our last step. You can go ahead and rotate this back to north. Now we shade in our stereo net. You shade in the side that has the arrow on it. Okay, so if it was reverse, you would shade in this polygon and this polygon. But since it's normal, you're going to shade in this polygon. and this one. All right, so what you have here is you have the fault plane, you have the auxiliary plane, and then you have it shaded where dilation is occurring and you have it unshaded where pressure is occurring. So to simplify that, what that means is that if we look at our principal stresses, sigma 1, or the direction of maximum compressive stress, needs to occur within, somewhere within this unshaded area for this fault to form. Okay. Um, if faults are occurring through rocks that are homogeneous and have no pre-existing weaknesses, then sigma 1 would be right in the middle of that. Okay. But since, in reality, rocks are not always homogeneous, and uh, we talked a lot about the history of Bryce Canyon and the many stresses that occurred in that area, there are for sure pre-existing fractures and weaknesses that can be taken advantage of. So all we can really infer from this diagram is that sigma 1 is somewhere within this white or unshaded area. And that is why we need multiple measurements to be able to constrain it or narrow it down to figure out where sigma 1 is occurring. Okay, So this is one, one piece of data that's helpful. What we can do is we can use our additional fault planes. So here I have another one and now I can overlay the two. And you'll notice that that narrows down the area that is unshaded even further. You'll notice that this small section over here, that other fault is shaded in in that area. Okay, so that means that sigma 1 is not likely occurring in that. And it even narrows down this other polygon. So now we are just looking at this area um, as the potential area where sigma 1, the maximum of compressive stress, uh, was to form these, these two different fault points. Okay, so if you repeat this with even more fault planes, you can, can constrain it even more to determine what, what really caused these complex and chaotic faults. All right, so hopefully this little tutorial um, was clear and it helps you 
understand how to um, sketch these focal mechanisms, uh, let us know if you have any questions.